This is Stand Up For The Truth, addressing important issues and topics affecting Christians across the nation. It is Thursday, September 19, 2024. It is a headline day with Mary Danielson, the latest headlines as of yesterday, Mm. because there's always going to be fresh new headlines. Yeah, Yeah. uh, that's for sure. Put a biblical spin on it here. Uh, Mary Danielson, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Yes, it's time for some headlines. I'm calling this podcast Headlines by the Numbers, not just in referring to how many I had to leave behind, but we're going to talk about exploding technology, mega churches, and Big Brother, because everything is exponential in these times. So let's just dig in. Psalm 84, 10 to 12. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give glory and grace. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Lord, thank you for another day to serve you and grow in grace in all things. Whether we are called home by you or you come for us as a church, we agree with the psalmist when he says, My soul longs, yes, even faints for your courts. My heart and flesh cry out for you. There's nowhere we'd rather be, Lord, to find rest for our souls. Thank you that we can set aside the things of this world and be captivated by you and your promises for our future. Keep us strong and uncompromising until that day, Lord, and give us the joy of our salvation every day. Let the words of our mouth be acceptable to you today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, September 19th, as we have established, it's the 263rd day of 2024. There are a mere 107 days left in this year. On this date, in 1778, the Continental Congress passed the first budget of the United States. It was $4 million. In 1783, uh, in aviation history, the Mongolflier brothers sent aloft a, uh, a balloon with a rooster, a duck, and a sheep aboard, opening the door for French aeronautics. Only a year later, in 1784, the U.S. sent up a manned hydrogen gas-powered balloon. And so it began. In 1796, George Washington delivered his farewell address, imploring the country to stay the course and avoid getting entangled in conflicts in Europe. George, i got to tell you, the course is rocky here in 2024. But he was referring to the French Revolutionary Wars and some guy named Napoleon when he gave that speech. In 1960, on the state, Chubby Checker's The Twist hit number one on the Billboard chart. You know you needed to know that. It's also Talk Like a Pirate Day and National Butterscotch Pudding Day. So those are freebies. This weekend... The UN Summit of the Future, which I have referred to on occasion, according to Leo Homan's article from last week, he tells us that their stated goal is to, quote, establish the framework for a new global system tailored to the digital age in a restructured world. They're promising more equality and inclusivity, especially in the economic arena. Now, the Bible already tells us that... uh, this about the Antichrist system where small and great, rich and poor, free and slave will be forced to decide whether they want to take this mark of the beast, this identifier. And, you know, it's the little details about prophecy that force us to sit up and take notice at the accuracy of things. Um, what did John see? But he faithfully recorded it 2,000 years ago. Well, the adoption of a pact for the future Uh, at the end of the event, is nothing more than a pact with the devil, of course, specifically says Leo Homan. We're going to look at his article a little bit. Um, UN Summit of the Future will kick off September 20 to 23 to build framework for new world system by Leo Homan. He says, the conference in the heart of modern Babylon marks the unveiling of the beast system and the nations of the world affirming the supremacy of the system. So he says his gut says it will be a pact with the devil. His leaders from the U.N. member states will attend the summit to reaffirm their unwavering commitment to the U.N., its charter, its principles, and its Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. They will vow to submit to all U.N. agencies, including the WHO and the International Court of Justice. 
All of this is designed to move us toward what the UN is calling a reinvigorated multilateral system better positioned to impact people's lives positively. Leo says, we must ask ourselves, when has the UN system ever impacted our lives in a positive way? And of course, he is correct about that. Back to the article about the Pact for the Future, the UN says on its website, this actionable document will be negotiated and endorsed by countries during the September 2024 summit, fostering a more resilient global community for current and future generations. And we will note there is no lawful authorization for any of it. Participants will include represent representatives from various UN agencies, selected non-governmental organizations, selected businesses and industries, representatives from universities and research institutes, selected municipalities, regional governments, and local authorities. They're all gathering to unite under the slogan of representatives of future generations. Buried deep in the bowels of this document is this little gem requiring member states to embed UN agreements and resolutions into their national laws. Member states will deepen UN engagement with national parliaments in UN intergovernmental bodies and processes in accordance with national legislation, including through building on the efforts of the UN and interparliamentary union to engage parliamentarians to maintain support for the implementation of relevant UN agreements and resolutions. Yikes. Um, talk about your word salad. Uh, Gutierrez, the unapologetic Portuguese socialist who runs the UN, says we can't build a future for our grandchildren with a system built by our grandparents. Oh, I would have to disagree with that. Leo says they're talking about scrapping the current world order based on sovereign nation states and switching to a new one that will be fully integrated under a centralized power structure and fully digital for maximized control of the masses. There's your numbers. There's our first numbers. Control of the masses. Everyone will be expected to have a biometric digital ID that marks them not just as citizens of their country, but as global citizens. Dissident opinions or unapproved expressions of reality <laughs> will be dismissed as misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and memory hold. Perpetrators of such unapproved information will be fact-checked and punished by the system, which will be operated and forced by the most efficient of means, AI. Punishments will include being locked out of one's bank account, unable to make certain purchases, unable to get a, on a plane or subway or drive on public roads. This is the future according to the world's self-appointed overlords at the UN. Um, he says, uh, Leo says, there are two chapters on in the draft of the Pact of the Future document, a chapter on science, technology, innovation, and digital cooperation, and a chapter on youth and future generations. The draft chapter on youth and future generations builds on the 1997 UNESCO Declaration on Responsibilities Towards Future Generations. So I think you get the general idea. Uh, we knew this was coming, but it is, uh, it's definitely... I wouldn't say it's scary because we knew, but it's definitely creepy and uh, nothing good will come out of this in New York this weekend. So you might want to keep an eye on that. And we have Gary Kahn next week and Terry James. And I'm thinking uh, it's altogether possible that this will come up with them. So keep an eye on the Pact for the Future Summit. All right. Now, if you have listened to this program for a while, you know how passionate I am about having a mindset of watching and waiting for the Lord. It is really valuable to train ourselves to have that priority, even while we occupy with so many mundane day-to-day -day tasks that, that really eat up our energy and eat up our thoughts. But we can train ourselves to, to rise above it. It really, a lot of this is on us through the power of the Holy Spirit to rise above a lot of the stuff. But we still have to occupy. We care for our kids. We care for our spouses. People are dealing with health and finances, and that doesn't change just because of the times that we're in. Life just has this rhythm day to day, and it just flies by. But it makes us think that we will, it will always be this way, and it won't always be this way. And um, in that vein, I like Jonathan Brentner's article, Pastors, Don't Let Your Churches Remain Unaware of What Lies Ahead. And if I can add here, Christians, challenge your pastors to speak about what lies ahead. But what Jonathan says in this article, this is just really good. 
He says, if I were to select one word that sums up most people today, it would be unaware. Despite the myriad of signs that tell us that the start of the tribulation period is long overdue, few people are paying attention. Most believers pursue their aspirations with little or no understanding of the times in which they live. Is this not yet another sign that we live in the last days? I believe it is, for in For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the days when Noah entered the the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be Matthew twenty four, thirty eight to thirty nine. Jonathan says the words they were unaware in the English Standard Version are literally they did not know in the original. Because the people in Noah's day didn't believe his warnings about God's impending judgment, it was as if they didn't know about it until it started raining. Some versions of the Bible translate these words, they did not understand. During the lengthy time required to build the ark, it seems likely that word of such a spectacle would have spread to most people living at the time. They saw so many things that were out of the ordinary with the building of a huge ark and the boarding of animals on it, yet... They remained oblivious to the coming flood until it started to rain. So there's this big old boat there, this big, 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 big sign. And I would imagine people gathered around, you know, from time to time, wondering what was going on. People are naturally curious. So they did have a very big sign. Jonathan says, just like in Noah's day, most people are unaware that things in the world will suddenly change in perhaps the near future. For decades, they've heard people like me point to the nearness of Jesus' appearing. Even though they've heard the warnings, they aren't knowledgeable of what lies ahead, and they're unaware of what's coming. Of what's coming. Because we don't know the precise timing of Jesus' appearing, we can't cease the normal activities of our lives and wait for him. However, Jesus' words concerning the days of Noah imply that we can do so with an awareness that he might dramatically intervene in our world at any moment. We may see the end of 2024 and perhaps the end of 2025. On the other hand, we may not see the end of today, this week, this month, or the next. Why do I believe it's so close? He says it's because the Lord continues to warn us of his nearness by allowing both believers and those outside the faith to see small yet vivid glimpses of the cataclysmic events described in Revelation. Many pastors, however, ignore the vast number of signs pointing to the nearness of the events. It is not unbelief that causes them to dismiss the book's message as having no significance. Is it, okay? Is it not? Is it not unbelief that causes them to dismiss the book's message as having no significance for believers today? It's because they do not understand the times in which they live that so many in their churches remain unaware of what lies ahead. Uh, and there's more to this article. Again, it's by Jonathan Bretner on Harbinger's. It's called Pastors, Don't Let Your Churches Remain Unaware of What Lies Ahead. So it's just a challenge um, because you can't, you can't make anyone um, think on these things on their own. We have to do that ourselves. We have our walk with the Lord the other six days of the week. But we need to have our priorities in order, have our house in order, and, and you know, let our kids know what's going on in the earth. And uh, so it is, it is a very, very good article. Many, many, many signs, headlines by the numbers. Speaking of the church... Um, In this next article, uh, they discuss something that I've been watching for a long time. Now, as I have watched evangelicalism, I don't really even like that description, uh, but it does seem to describe the church as a movement of sorts in the 80s. But, you know, in the church, we know it's not a movement except of the Holy Spirit. It's not a, I guess, as an outward movement, people want to label things. And it's called evangelicalism. Um, but it does seem to describe this, this movement of sorts, and it has evolved. And it has become a uh, cultural force, both spiritually and politically. The church has embraced some things that don't really express what the church is meant to express on earth and represent on earth. And a lot of it actually is very grievous. From purpose-driven to the emergent church, from Charismatic excesses to the NAR from the shack to the megachurch, there never seems to be any lack of attention-getting shenanigans for all the wrong reason. Um, You know, has the last day's church sold its soul for the desire to be seen and admired? I mean, just how is the, you know, how narrow is the narrow way? I often ask myself that. 
If few there be that find it, uh, is the visible church overrun by false converts? Now, I don't know the answers to these things, but there's a certain amount of pain involved in, the, in following the trendy aspects of Christianity and observing it. Now, I want to look at the phenomenon of the megachurch. Having a, a church with tens of thousands of attendees on any given weekend isn't wrong of itself looking at it from a distance. I personally would not uh, desire to be part of one uh, because of, number one, the impersonal nature of it, and of course, um, the inability of a staff to actually keep up with any aspect of running such a thing or getting to know people on a personal level uh, as the body, I think, should function. Secondly, the doctrinal nature of the megachurch, because built into this model is the tendency to be shallow and people-pleasing to maintain such an overgrown institution. Not to mention that huge, huge churches can and do have sometimes disastrous doctrine, such as the word faith types, and then we add to that the secret sensitive model. And you really do have a recipe for doctrinal disaster that does not produce lasting fruit and true conversion. I think a lot of us were thinking those things, but now, about 20 years in or so, we're going to look at the fruit. Now, there are solid, large churches. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. There must be some. Charles Spurgeon's church in 1881, near the end of his life, had 5,500 members. It's not about that. This is about a ministry model 100 years later. Now, Charles Spurgeon began to pastor at the age of 19, and he was called to pastor a historic congregation in London. And uh, there was a remarkable revival at the time, allowed by God. And so during his 38 years of being a pastor, he did preach to capacity crowds. But as gifted as he was, um, they weren't all converted through his preaching. And he'll be the, he would be the first to tell you that. He actually gave credit for the size of his congregation to his congregation because he told his congregation to go out and share the gospel. And uh, he says here, somebody asked me how I got my congregation. I never got it at all. I didn't think it was my business to do that, but just to preach the gospel. My congregation got my congregation. So, in other words, um, going out, sharing the hope, um, healthy sheep, begetting healthy sheep, and that's how that worked. That's not necessarily how it works today. Another reason that I uh, have an issue or would not be part of a megachurch is the tendency to be obsessed with money to maintain all that and the danger of elevating personalities and a cult of self because I truly believe humans were never designed to be at the center of attention above other humans for any length of time. And I think this is very difficult. Um, it, it, it leads to narcissism, and, and for a pastor to model the servanthood that the Bible teaches about is very, very difficult when there are so many personalities and brands out there. So how we got to the point where we are constantly need new ministry models to express what God has already given us in the Bible escapes me, but I often wonder if it isn't the arm of the flesh that wants to get credit for a new move of the Spirit instead of the other way around. I think we have that backwards. The Holy Spirit opening doors of ministry first and then everything flowing from that. You know, cart and horse <laughs> generally reversed when humans try to birth the next big thing or they're obsessed with numbers or when they teach that and believe that the church has to be relevant to the culture. So now we have evangelical leaders who do not speak for me, but they seem to want to run ahead and claim that whatever they're doing is an organic move of God when oftentimes it is anything but. I mean, we'd all love to see genuine revival, wouldn't we? Everyone wants to see that. But um, I think uh, the evangelical church of the last 30, even uh, 30, 20, 30 years is, is just uh, something that I did not anticipate. I think these movements uh, have an expiration date. Often the personalities get richer at believer's expense. Um, evangelical leaders that no one knows, it's supposed to be shepherds and pastors, local pastors. So again, they don't speak for me. And I, I don't want to sound cynical, but I've been watching this for a very long time. And this article I'm about to, to get into is very 
transparent. It's very uh, enlightening. And before I get into it quickly here, if a church has as its starting point cultural relevancy, it's already on the express tollway to compromise. We are not here to impress the culture, and we are not here to redeem it. So recently an article came out that I have mentioned, Four Unintended Consequences of the Megachurch Movement and How to Solve Them. It's a look back at this movement, good, bad, and ugly. Um, Again, I'm not going to say don't attend one, of course, but I'm going to say pray about what church to go to. Um, And I've wondered if megachurches aren't a self-fulfilling medium because people go because, well, other people go. (laughs) The danger of such thinking, of course, besides that herd mentality, is that if all these people go there, it must be good, okay? You know, it must be sound. It must be good. All these people can't be wrong. Well, yeah, they can. And that is carnal thinking because... People have to look under the hood, whatever church they go to. Um, Otherwise, they may become stunted in their Christian growth or worse yet, be deceived. Because, let's face it, churches like Saddleback and Willow Creek, Bethel and Hillsong have multiple problems that will likely not be solved in this life. And word faith teachers notoriously never repent and give all that money back to the people they have fleeced for 60 years and then some. So let's dive into this. Four Unintended Consequences of the Megachurch Movement and How to Solve Them by Stephen Whitlow. This is from just a couple of weeks ago. When I was a 17-year-old high school senior, I had to write a senior paper. My family had left our Assembly of God church a few years prior and found ourselves at the up-and-coming local megachurch. I fell in love with it, so much so that my paper's thesis statement was the following. Without the seeker-sensitive movement, the American church will fail and become irrelevant to modern culture. The seeker model is the hope of the American church. Then he says, man, was I wrong. He had my attention at that point. 20 years later, all but one of which were spent in full-time ministry, I can see the error of my ways and the immediate need to redirect the American church from the squishy, seeker-sensitive center-right. You can make the case that there were positives to the seeker movement, at least at that point. It really did a lot of good in my life and had significant impact on young future pastors like myself. I was personally inspired by a church that seemed to have figured out how to help people enjoy being at church each Sunday, which I had not experienced before, reach the lost, I knew those I would invite would hear the gospel, and also had figured out how to run things with excellence. For a few decades, it seemed like everyone from Baptists to seatbelt-wearing charismatics were moved moving to some version of the seeker model. With it came large churches, celebrity pastors, conferences, and church planting networks. Now, if you're listening and you're not sure what the seeker-sensitive model is, it was more or less, and this is very simplified, um, you know, just taking um, a survey of your community and of people who go to church and say, what would you like to see in a church? Well, you know what? There's pastors and teachers. The Bible says what you should see in a church. It's up to the leaders of the churches to set the tone for them not the people, not the consumer. And it really has led to a consumer mentality towards church going uh, and picking a church based on any number of elements that may or may not even be spiritual. So that's the general idea of the secret sensitive church. So he goes on to say, but the hype wasn't worth the long-term damage. My realization of this came in a management team meeting in the early 2010s. I, in my mid-twenties, was pastoring and preaching in a church of well over 8,000 people. We were having a meeting about the kids' ministry, and I asked a simple question. We've had some of these kids for 18 years now. What do they know? The answer was they knew very little. Sure, they knew our mission statement and where the pop fountain was, but little else. It dawned on me that we had failed them miserably. Such an answer to this simple question is a snapshot into what was happening in the American church across the country at that time. Since then, the unintended consequences of the megachurch have started to be revealed. Here are four of them. Unintended consequence number one, the church as a product. A me-centered church was ripe to fall into self-serving humanistic thinking. We were setting ourselves up for failure without really knowing the impending doom our nation would face as it struggled to figure out its identity apart from God. The seeker-sensitive church built self-service into its foundations How could we challenge people to repent of their feelings when we had spent the last two decades telling them how much they mattered and how special they were and boosting their self-esteem? I'm going to add that. Unintended consequence number two. 
Again, if you're just tuning in, this is Mary Danielson with some headlines today. The article is Four Unintended Consequences of the Megachurch Movement and How to Solve Them by Stephen Whitlow. Unintended Consequence number two, doctrine as secondary. We replaced solid biblical teaching with self-help TED Talks. Sure, they often reference the Bible, but there's a big difference between using Bible verses and preaching the text. Amen to that. Churches talk about the Bible. They are not teaching the Bible. Big difference. He says the seeker movement managed to stay somewhat theologically sound for a decade or two, not because it grew former unbelievers into well-instructed, mature, mature disciples, but because it inherited a group of mature believers who had already previously been well-instructed. There's a barometer that nobody looked at. But after 20 years of self-help sermons, even those formerly mature believers were now sufficiently doctrinally emaciated that they were ripe for the progressive infiltration of the church. Unintended consequence number three. I'm probably going to get to one more before the break here. Let's keep going. A social club instead of a family. It feels good to be embraced by a club and feel part of something bigger than yourself. In some cases, this meant way bigger with tens of thousands in attendance and campuses across the state. Like any club, there are rules, and if you don't follow the rules, you can't sit with us. So in the club, you learn to follow the rules, and in the megachurch, the rules are pretty clear. They are worth unpacking more fully elsewhere, but they include things like, you must pledge full allegiance to the brand and nothing else, and when you leave, you we, we will either ruin you or forget you ever existed. Or, you must never ask if our methods are biblical because who are you to ask such questions when we heroes have built this massive church? Or your greatest endeavor as a believer is to lay down your life for the brand, so don't ask us to open up during COVID or question masks or unbelievers will consider us unloving. Or if the stage says it, it must be true. These rules are unwritten and unstated, but very much enforced. Unintended consequence number four, creating cogs in the wheel. Discipleship moved from being formed in Christ to being formed into a good part of the church machine. If someone attended Sundays, joined a small group, served on a team, paid their tithes, they were the model church member and little else was asked. This kind of training makes really good church attendees, but really weak disciples of Christ. What next, he says. All of these unintended consequences set the church up to fail. Such failure took place during COVID when the culture and the government forced them in a more liberal direction, and most have not recovered. In fact, many of these churches are doubling down on their leftward drift and becoming weaker and weaker. Meanwhile, the future of the church and our country depends on us employing a different model and equipping the saints while also reaching the lost. Amen, amen, amen. There are practicalities that we can take from the megachurch movement, but the next era of church in this nation must correct the errors above. There needs to be a course correction, he is saying. With that in mind, here are my suggested counters. And I don't want to get into that until after the break. Um, but you're listening to Stand Up For The Truth for this uh, Thursday. And the article is Four Unintended Consequences of the Mega Church Movement and How to Solve Them. Of course, look under the hood of where you go to church. Pray about where to go to church. But we're going to look at the solutions when we come back. So we're going to take a two minute break. Stay with me today on Headline Day. I'll be back in two minutes. Q90 FM presents the Police Lights of Christmas, helping over 70 police departments across Wisconsin. Each department is going to leave this night with a box full of thousands of dollars worth of gift cards. Visit lightsofchristmas.us. Police Lights of Christmas, a ministry of Q90 FM. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for Thursday, September the 19th. We're talking about headlines today, headlines by the numbers, and I want to finish this uh, Four Unintended Consequences of the Megachurch Movement and How to Solve Them by Stephen Whitlow, and then we're going on to talk about Israel. Um, so he says, here are my suggested counters for all these things. It's a very transparent, well-thought-out article. He says, number one, instead of seeing the church as a product, embrace church as simple but meaningful. Instead of creating the most complicated system imaginable, make your church as simple as possible while still being able to reach people. 
Say no to some lights, camera, and action, and say yes to reflective prayer, corporate reading, expository preaching. These are the steps that will return health to the body, and I amen that as well. Number two, instead of viewing doctrine as secondary, horrors, unify around core doctrine. Many people in your church are more than likely doctrinally emaciated. Think over your core doctrines. Let them filter through everything you do. More than dwelling into niche topics that fly over everyone's heads, the average believer desperately needs to deepen their convictions around core doctrine, and doing so will go a long way into strengthening the church. Number three, instead of viewing church as a social club, view it as a family. This seems like a cheap line, but it is not. The scriptures describe our relationship to each other more frequently using family terms. So create a family fund to make sure every legitimate need in your church is met. Build a ministry that allows your attendees to build a life rhythm around the body of Christ instead of perhaps the baseball diamond or the soccer fields. And there's nothing wrong with those, but church should be. Church should be the priority. Maybe show some humility as a leader that lets people know you're part of the church family and not just the celebrity on stage. Number four, instead of creating cogs in the wheel, develop rounded disciples. Imagine teaching a football player only how to run. That's a necessary skill, but not even close to all the abilities they need to perform well. Similarly, discipleship needs to go well beyond simple give and serve and invite model and teach people to obey everything that Christ has commanded. Yes, application, application, application. Live it out the other six days or five or four, however often you're at church. Finally, encourage people to be deeper rooted in their faith, living it out in every part of life rather than simply teaching them how to apply it within the four walls of the church will cultivate deep roots. As such, they will be much less liable to sway with every changing wind of false doctrine that blows their way. Thank you, Stephen Whitlow. That was excellent. All right. And as I said earlier, teach them the things that are coming on the earth so they are ready. All right. Headlines by the numbers. On to exploding devices and one of the strangest things that we have seen in these here perilous times. And I start out with an email I get every day from Zaka Tel Aviv. They are the first responders in Israel. Day 348 of the war. This is from yesterday. Uh, he says, as you may have heard, Israel has just executed one of the most innovative and unprecedented attacks on Hezbollah in history. Using intelligence from Mossad and the IDF, explosives were planted in thousands of radios and pagers the terror group has used for communication. Just moments ago, and this was yesterday, reports emerged of hundreds of Hezbollah radios exploding in southern Lebanon, reportedly killing three more terrorists. This follows Tuesday's uh, attack where over 4,000 Hezbollah operatives were injured, 200 critically and 400 blinded by the explosions. The death toll stands at eight terrorists, with 19 members of the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps also killed in Syria. 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 While these blows to Hezbollah are significant, Israel is bracing for serious retaliation, and of course, I would expect that. Uh, I do want to quote here from Jeff Childers. His uh, I've mentioned his blog, Coffee and COVID, many times. Really enjoyed Jeff every single day. He's going to be on the podcast in October. Very excited about that. He says, this is curiouser and curiouser from Jeff yesterday. It is perfectly impossible to exaggerate the off-the-charts freakishness of this next fantastic, over-the-top, literally explosive 2024 story. And how many times have we said this is going to be one of the weirdest years ever? Well, it is. Yesterday, Israel's spy agencies apparently killed, maimed, or wounded up to 5,000 Hezbollah enemies without firing a shot using exploding pagers. The Wall Street Journal covered the story under its headline, Hezbollah pagers explode in apparent attack across Lebanon. Iranian-connected, Lebanon-based Hezbollah is a well-equipped Muslim militia and U.S.-designated terror group that has been skirmishing with Israel since October 7th. Recently, following Israel's assassination of a high-profile Hezbollah leader, the group switched from using high-tech smartphones to lower-tech pagers for communication. They switched for safety. They switched so Israel could not follow them. Yesterday, up to 5,000 Hezbollah militants all simultaneously received a highly unwelcome message on their pagers. Seconds later, the tiny devices spontaneously detonated, seriously injuring the users, users blowing off their hands, violently severing even more delicate body parts, and overwhelming Le Lebanese hospitals with the wounded. 
So far, a dozen Hezbollah fighters have died from the trauma, and that number will probably increase. Jeff says, nobody knows how the mass assassination was done. Israel hasn't even confirmed it was involved, but they haven't denied it either. Speculation is running rampant, with corporate media doing its best to cover and reassure everyone that all our devices are perfectly safe. This is not an undocumented feature of lithium battery technology, and don't worry, it can't be deployed against any inconvenient personage like you. Theories abound. Maybe Israeli operatives somehow in intercepted all the pager shipments and cunningly injected explosives that were then somehow triggered by a single pager message. Now, this is what I've most commonly heard. Or maybe the Taiwanese pager manufacturer, manufacturer cooperated or was infiltrated by Israeli spies. Or maybe the Israelis figured out how to blow up lithium batteries in certain devices on command. We don't know. We may never know. One thing is certain, though, now every intelligence agency in the world has learned a nifty new trick. Not just for one-off assassinations like the CIA's infamous exploding cigar, but for mass-marketed, high-precision weapons of mass destruction. We have indeed raced down the rabbit hole. And Jeff says, ready to retire your smartphone yet? Well, I'm thinking of Pandora's box because this we woke up to a new world. If you really think this through... Um, Robert Malone, Dr. Robert Malone, who I read every day, uh, has, gives a very sobering assessment. And I'm, I'm just going to read some of this. But you're going to get the general idea. And if you don't know the mythology about Pandora's box, Zeus gave Pandora, the first woman, a box. And he said, don't open that. Well, curiosity got the better of her. And she opened it and out flew all the world's evils, which I think is a counterfeit story of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That would be my guess here. But hope did not get out of the box. It was stuck under the lid, apparently, according to the mythology. Um, and as a church, we have the hope. We have that hope because we've been redeemed by Jesus Christ. And he sent that Redeemer. The plan goes all the way back to Genesis. And we have that hope. And so we need to bring hope into these situations, of course, through the gospel. But when we talk about Dr. Robert Malone, he says, A new phase of war between Israel and Hezbollah has begun. Another ethical boundary has been breached, and a wide variety of state and non-state actors will now adopt and adapt this strategy. This new battlefront involves personal electronic devices and the integration of triggered explosives into those devices. In the current embodiment, these devices were deployed using nonspecific personnel targeting. However, it seems likely that future deployment will involve both nonspecific and individually targeted exploding devices. The implications for public transportation, including air and crowded environments, are self-evident. Beyond the damage done to an individual, the potential of the strategy to evoke terror, existential fear, and a variety of forms of disruption is immense. It really, really is. If you're thinking down the road on this, <laughs> it's almost like Israel saying to these terror groups. You think you know what terrorism is? Well, you're going to find out what terrorism really is. This is just phenomenal. Don't mess with Israel. That would be the bottom line here. But he says, Robert Malone says, to illustrate the point, remember that psychological bioterror strategies and events are associated with 100 to 1,000 times the economic and societal damage related to a bioterror agent's actual physical deployment. In this current example, current reports indicate something in the range of 10 to 20 direct deaths attributable to exploding personal electronic devices and up to 3,000 wounded. However, the indirect psychological effects will be far more damaging. You're talking about perilous times. I think this is in that category, and it is, is ramping up. This is undoubtedly what was intended. Not only Hezbollah fighters, but virtually the whole world must now be alert and actively mitigating the possibility that their personal electronic devices, most of which are made in China, make a note, may incorporate explosives capable of killing or maiming them. Of course, this will include pagers, laptops, cell phones, and other electronic devices. Remember, we are rapidly approaching the age of general artificial intelligence, drones, and robot warriors. The lithium batteries that most personal electronic devices employ are notorious for exploding or otherwise burning. It seems likely there will be many variations and derivatives of this strategy. In a sense, it's an extension and escalation of the improvised explosive device, that's an IED, 
tactic that has been so successfully deployed in Afghanistan and throughout the Middle East by insurgent and resistant cells. The potential economic impact should not be overlooked, particularly for personal electronic device markets. Now, I noticed today the headline of an Israel Ynet News, pager manufacturer BAC goes dark after Lebanon explosions. CEO denies involvement. BAC, registered in Hungary's corporate registry in 2022, presents itself as a consultancy firm, and a woman listed as the CEO claims she's merely a broker. The company address points to a residence, and the website filled with generic images and vague project descriptions has been taken down. So it sounds shady in the first place. But anyway, he's, as he's talking about the economic impacts here, Robert Malone says this will lead to the need for some packaging and validation solutions to reassure consumers that a purchase device is certified free of explosive risk, as well as new screening and monitoring process for air travel. The implications are profound. I doubt Mossad or whatever organization is responsible for this has fully considered the blowback. So yes, it is a Pandora's box. Um, Hezbollah, which is, now this, this is an attack on Iran, too. So you can't leave them out of the equation. They have vowed to retaliate against Israel. Um, their, their military has declined to comment. To me, the world is kind of quiet. I thought all the Israel haters in the world would absolutely lose their minds. And it seems a little quiet. So I don't know what to think about that. But from yesterday, um, walkie-talkies were blowing up across Lebanon in second wave attacks. Um, the militant group was scrambling to assess the extent and nature of the explosions which hit, which hit a day after an attack attributed to Israel caused thousands of pagers to explode. Um, many of the affected pagers were from a new shipment that Hezbollah had received recently, part of a year-long process to swap out older devices. They detonated in unison at 3.30 p.m. on Tuesday. Um, hmm. Yeah, they are saying that, that Israel uh, intercepted the shipment and, and did that. So, ah. Regardless, I think Dr. Robert Malone is one who has really not overstated the consequences from here on out. This is a whole new world. Um, yeah. All right. You can do your homework on that one. Here's something that we kind of hoped we had never, we would never see. But I don't know. I kind of expected it. Should we be surprised? Woman found guilty of fatally infecting neighbor with COVID-19. Oh, boy. This is from Children's Health Defense Headlines. Uh, just, I would encourage you to subscribe if you have not. It's called The Defender. I've been reading it for many, many years. Um, RFK Jr.'s uh, site full of videos and, and um, posts Really, really interesting stuff. Children'sHealthDefense.org, if you're interested in that. But yes, a woman found guilty of fatally infecting her neighbor with COVID. I mean, seriously. A 54-year-old woman in Austria was found guilty of fatally infecting her neighbor with COVID-19 three years ago, according to a September 13th report. On September 12th, a judge sentenced the woman to four months suspended imprisonment and fined her $886.75 for grossly negligent homicide. I'm actually surprised she got off that easy, considering this was pursued against her. The AP reported that local media said the punishment was the second time the woman has received a pandemic-related conviction in a year. Due to Austrian privacy rules, the names of the deceased and the defendant have not been released. Citing the Austria Press Agency, the AP said the victim was a cancer patient and died of pneumonia caused by the coronavirus. An expert reportedly told the court that tests showed that the virus DNA matched both the victim and the 54-year-old woman. So that's kind of disturbing that they can do a DNA test and find out if, you know, you breathed on someone or you're in close contact with someone, whether you knowingly had it or, you know, didn't even know you had it. And what about people with, who have gotten the jab and shed, shed the uh, virus? I mean, this, again, more Pandora's box, more crazy numbers. That is from, again, childrenshealthdefense.org. This is also from that. Google announces beta tests for digital IDs based on biometrics and U.S. passports. A new type of digital ID is based on U.S. passports in Google Wallet, 
has been introduced ahead of beta testing. Users can scan the chip in their passport and match their selfie biometrics with a short video. Google Wallet VP and GM Jenny Cheng calls this type of digital ID an ID pass in a blog post on the pending beta program. The biometric industry verification process is complete and digital ID is ready to use a few minutes after the verification data is submitted. It's just oh so easy. TSA checkpoints that accept digital IDs will accept Google's ID Pass. TSA has posted a handy digital ID map that shows it is now accepting digital ID at 28 airports across 21 states and Puerto Rico. They also plan uh, to expand the use cases for passport-based digital IDs like account recovery, car rentals, I mean, you name it. You guys are smart. You know that this is just going to be all pervasive before you know it. Um, our new world order elites plotting to use AI to deprogram conspiracy theorists. <laughs> this is from Zero Hedge and Children's Defense. Might the new world order use biased, pre-manipulated pre AI programs to deprogram those with unpopular opinions by persuading them that their logic does not compute? <laughs> yeah, just try. <laughs> A recent study on that subject underwritten by the John Templeton Foundation, well, there you go, might give so-called conspiracy theorists one more thing to be paranoid about, according to popular science. Critics has, have already sounded the alarm that leftist radicals in Silicon Valley and elsewhere were manipulating the algorithms used to train AI so that it automatically defaulted to anti-conservative biases. Surprise! The next step may be programming any verboten viewpoints into the realm of conspiracy theory and then having powerful computers challenge human users to battle a battle of logic that is stacked against them with cherry-picked data. Good grief. So, fact-checking. Somebody said the other day, with all these fact-checkers who seem to know the truth, why don't we get them all together and do a newscast with nothing but facts, which you know is never, ever, ever going to happen. Uh, one more here in this realm. Omnipresent AI cameras will ensure good behavior, says Larry Ellison. On Thursday, Oracle co-founder Larry Ellison shared his vision for an AI-powered uh, surveillance future during a company financial meeting, reports Business Insider. During an investor Q&A, Ellison described a world where AI systems would constantly monitor citizens through an invasive, extensive network of cameras and drones, stating this would ensure both police and citizens don't break the law. And we knew that was coming, too. They do that in China, and there will be a model in the West based on the social credit score in China that I reported on probably a good 10 years ago now. Ellison, who briefly became the world's second wealthiest person last week when his net worth surpassed Jeff Bezos for a short time, outlined a scenario where AI models would analyze footage from security cameras, body, police body cams, doorbell cams, and vehicle dash cams. Citizens will be on their best behavior because we are constantly recording and reporting everything that's going on, he said, describing what he sees as the benefits from automated oversight from AI and automated alerts when crime takes place. We're going to have supervision, he said. Every police officer is going to be supervised at all times, and there's a problem. AI will report it and report it to the appropriate person. Yeah, we knew that was coming. FDA approves vaccine for monkeypox, warns it may cause death in, vaccinated, in the vaccinated and the people they come in contact with. We don't need a vaccine for monkeypox. But this article says a vaccine approved in August by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for people deemed to be at high risk for monkeypox may cause more harm than good. More surprises, right? According to the, own, the FDA's own medication guide, ACAM2000, not to be confused with Acme 2000, if you watch Looney Tunes, made by Emergent Biosolutions, a company specializing in vaccines for biochemical warfare threats such as anthrax and smallpox, was approved for smallpox in 2007. However, on August 29th, the FDA issued an expanded supplement approval for the Acme 2000 <laughs> against monkeypox. Since then, social media users have been posting clips of the FDA's Acme 2000 medication guide, which warns the vaccine may cause serious complications in both the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, that they come in close contact with up to six weeks after getting the shot. Don't stand too close. Headlines by the numbers. Surveilling the masses, marking the masses, blowing up massive 
amounts of tech devices. I had an interesting conversation with J.B. Hickson yesterday afternoon, and he said something that, that really stuck with me. There is only one God. He is omnipresent and omniscient, and he loves and cares for us, and he watches over us with perfect love. Do a study sometime on all the verses that says that God watches over his people and he doesn't slumber and he does not sleep. Now let's consider the God of this world. He is neither omnipresent nor omniscient, but he still wants to control the world and everyone in it so that he can be worshiped as God. What's in his toolbox? Watching over us, yeah, via technology and surveillance, Numbering everyone, marking everyone, causing global chaos, using global chaos um, to control us with a perfect hate for every person. The only power he has is by the numbers and via technology that will be used for the ultimate evil. The world is ripe for Antichrist and his counterfeit plan to have humanity end up where he will be, where he wants them to be. This is the war. We have to remember the war that is going on and all this numbering and all these headlines by the numbers and and massive numbers of everything is really just uh, more and more of the the kingdom of this world. The whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. It's time to go home. (laughs) But we, we should fear not because our adoption as sons and daughters is drawing nigh in the midst of the chaos. And we all are experiencing these same birth pangs. We are all experiencing all the chaos and all the numbers and all the headlines. But we know, we know what our destiny is. There are two different destinies. We have to rise above it and share the gospel when we have an opportunity because we already have been warned. We knew all this was coming. Of course, it's, it's one thing to intellectualize it 30 years ago and say, oh, that's what the world's going to be like. And, you know, and just... Let that rattle around in your head. It's a whole other thing to actually be in the middle of it. Perilous times. I got time for maybe one more here. Um, this is from Liberty, Liberty Sentinel. This is Alex Newman. Biden plan to help parents is a trap. This is interesting. Uh, under the guise of helping parents deal with stress, and we have them, adults have stress, lots of it, The Biden administration is plotting a dramatic expansion of government into the home. In short, federal authorities are seeking to take on even more responsibilities traditionally associated with the family and drugging ever larger numbers of Americans. Talk about your frog in a pot. Critics are sounding an alarm. Among other concerns, opponents are warning of a government power grab underway that seeks to further empower the state and undermine the family. This is why we get out and vote. We vote for people that support the traditional family. In the bizarre new report by Biden-appointed Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, the senior health bureaucrat classifies parental stress levels as a major public health problem. Do you think, like, the government is causing the stress? Well, okay, I think that's the elephant in the room. But anyway, and of course, with public health excuses such as COVID comes the presumption that government solutions are required and traditional limits on power are to be discarded. Among the unconstitutional recommendations offered by Murthy, more tax-funded mental health screenings for parents, more tax-funded drugs, and more tax-funded profits for pharma, more taxpayer-funded child care programs, cash assistance, and tax-funded mandates for companies. The Biden admins' fingerprints are all over this report. As Axios puts it, some of the remedies dovetail with Harris's economic plan. Politico, meanwhile, noted the recommendations such as universal tax-funded pre-K we're in line with Democratic presidential candidate Harris's campaign pitch. Um, the report also tries to use parental stress to promote other totalitarian-inspired policies on unrelated issues. Being worried about gun violence is a significant source of parental stress, according to the experts. So it's now been dubbed a public health problem. Therefore, i.e., government must act Yeah, well, you know, it's just, um, it's going to get worse. Go out and vote. Because I think um, at least we can try to make uh, an effort here. But also don't lose your hope. Do not lose hope. It's stuck to the underside of the cover of that Pandora's box. But we have the hope. 
Speaking of hope and sharing the gospel tomorrow, Ray Comfort and his new book, 50 Years of Open Air Preaching, Everything I've Learned. It is a great book. I'm getting so much out of it, enjoying it very, very much. Uh, again, and next week, Terry James on Tuesday, Gary Ka on Thursday, and we're going to probably carry on, carry over some of these headlines uh, next week because uh, they're not going away, and we'll see what happens when we wake up tomorrow morning. So keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, Jude 21. So stand firm, stand firm. Have a great day. <laughs>